Game on, ladies and gentlemen. You're listening to Box Score Radio, brought to you by the Keaton Podcasting Network. I'm your host, Jay Keaton. It is Monday, March 4th, 2019. And today's show is going to be mostly recapping UFC 235 pay-per-view. Um, talk a little bit about the games from the AAF this weekend, as well as college basketball and action from the NBA. So, as I said on Saturday, early morning Saturday show, UFC 235, stacked card. I don't believe it disappointed. Some people out there might might think that the uh, fights fell flat. Me personally, I, fuck, I fucking loved it. So we'll just discuss the main card. Cody Garbrandt lost by TKO to Pedro Munoz. I really didn't see this one coming. I thought for sure Cody would get back on track and uh, would avoid losing three straight fights. But um, uh, bad habits are hard to break. And uh, he's got a bad habit of when he gets in trouble or when he even gets, he smells blood, he just starts swinging for the wind. And um, <laughs> swinging for the wind, swinging for the fences rather. And uh, when he does that, he leaves himself that leaves him leaves himself exposed. And uh, Pedro Munoz was able to capitalize on it. Both guys went back and forth. It was a round one TKO with four fifty four minutes fifty two seconds into the first round. Cody landed some big shots. Pedro landed some big shots, but. One in particular got him right on the chin, knocked, took him down, knocked him out. The referee jumped in, and uh, it was a big win for Pedro Munoz, who's won seven of his last eight fights. And for Cody, again, go back to the drawing board and understand that he, he's fast, he's strong, he hits hard, but he leaves himself exposed way too much. And when he gets into this brawling mode that he seems to get in, he lose focus of his training, and he pretty much, it cost him again. Tisha Torres versus Weili Zhang. Weili Zhang wins by unanimous decision. Very entertaining. Total strikes here. Weili Zhang was 118 of 204. Tisha Torres was 33 of 65. That pretty much explains the fight. Weili Zhang was aggressive. She was able to throw a little bit more and land a little bit more. She was throwing spinning back kicks, spinning back kicks, trying to land that, spinning back fist. She was also able to take Tisha Torres down with a headlock a bunch of times. Um, Weili Zhang, Tisha Torres is a great fighter, but she's not at that level and I don't think she'll ever be at that level no offense to her she's built like a shit brick house very strong but the problem the problem is she's not that aggressive and she really has a timid um, approach in fighting Weili Zhang on the other hand she's very aggressive she does leave herself exposed way too much which is in, in the end gonna cost her She's end up going to facing somebody who can find her chin, and she's going to get knocked out. But still, it was a good win for her against the top ten opponent at straw weight. Okay, third fight on the main card: Ben Askren submits Raleigh, Robbie Lawler, first round, three minutes twenty seconds in. I was on Twitter a lot after this fight. Um. If you heard, you see, you know, you know that it was a very bad stoppage. I'm not going to say horrible stoppage, but it was a bad stoppage. For those of you, of the of you who don't who didn't watch the fight, um, basically Robbie Lawler picks him up, throws him on his head in the first twenty seconds of the fight, lands some big shots. Askren somehow survives it. He gets back to his feet. Presses Lawler up against the cage. I mean, what a chin, Ben Askren. He must have had th three or four of the biggest shots I've ever seen on the ground. His head's bouncing left and right, back and forward. And Lawler, at one point, had a look on his face like, Are you fucking kidding me? This guy is still not out. And Askren was able to work back to his feet, press him up against the cage, use his wrestling, and take him down. He gets his back slightly, 
and uh, he's able to get him in a bulldog choke. And what a bulldog choke is, for those you don't know, it's basically like a headlock. You know, before you give somebody a noogie, it's that, you know, you put them up, their head's facing, you and him are facing the same way, and you, you're squeezing as tight as you can. It wasn't around his neck, it was around his, his face, and he was just squeezing as tight as he can. And what happens is this. It's, it's near the cage, so it's not near the center. And Lawler's hand goes limp for a split second. It falls to the ground. And, uh, you know, if, if Herb Dean would have stopped the fight then, as soon as he saw his hand go limp, I could understand it. The problem is he didn't. And then when Lawler was regaining his focus... And uh, Herb Dean goes in to try to check his arm. He shakes his arm. His arm moves. For, he, his arm goes up, and then he gives the thumbs up. The problem is Herb Dean's not looking at his arm. He's looking at his head at this point, and that's when he jumps in, separates them, says the fight's over. And as soon as he does that, Ben Askren stands up, and less than a second later, Robbie Lawler he's on his feet, looking at Herb Dean. Perfectly conscious, screaming at him, yelling, what the fuck did you just do? And that's, you know, when you're choked out, you don't get up within a half second and start yelling at the ref, you know, consciously. It just doesn't happen that way. And what's annoying, the what's and mistakes do happen, it was, like I said, it was a bad stoppage, not a horrible stoppage, because you could see how he maybe thought that Lawler was out. But what annoys me more than anything is people who are trying to say that, um, well, he was clearly out. And, you know, when people try to make an argument and they don't give facts or they or they they're giving facts that don't exist, you know, that they're, they're trying to say that something that didn't happen. We all interpret things differently. But when you sit there and say he was clearly out and he stands up as soon as he lets go. Of the choke, it, that's not true. He was never out. His arm went limp because of exhaustion. You know, if anybody who's ever been put in a choke hole knows this, that um, when you um, there's a point where you re the first thing you do is try to move your body and you and use your energy to try to get out of the hole. And when you can't, but you're not getting suffocated, you kind of just you kind of exhale, stop for a second, and wait for him to tire out. And I think that's what Robbie Lawler was doing. And that's why his arm went limp is because he it was just his exhaustion saying, okay, you know, I got to stop for a second because he doesn't have the choke on me deep enough. And I'm just going to wait for him to, to burn out his energy, wait for his arm to get tired, and then I'm going to take it. I'm going to pick him up. I'm either going to break out or I'm going to pick him up and slam him again. That's what he was doing, and the problem is, is that Herb Dean rushed to judgment, thinking that he was out. And like I said, if he would have checked him the first time when his arm went limp, if he would have stopped it, then I would have said it wasn't a bad stoppage; it was just accidental. But when you shake his hand and his hand goes up, and then he gives the thumbs up, but you're not looking at it; you're looking at his head, and then it's a bad stoppage, and you didn't you didn't do your due diligence in the fight. So, bottom line, Ben Askren moves to nineteen and zero, and he got his ass kicked. I mean, he he took some serious shots. He's got a hell of a chin. That's the one thing we didn't know about him is how tough he was when he gets hit, and he's fucking tough. I do not see him losing simply because his wrestling is so good, his jujitsu is elite, and his now that he know now that we know his chin is that good, it's gonna be very hard for anybody to beat him. Co main event. A lot of people didn't like this one. I thought it was very exciting. Kamar Usman, new welterweight champion, unanimous decision victory over Tyrone Woodley. Five rounds, total strikes three thirty six of three ninety for Kamara, sixty of seventy nine. For Tyrone. It basically sums it up. Kamura Usman was pressuring him. He was coming forward, putting him against the cage, trying to take him down. He must have landed at least a hundred shots to the ribs of Woodley. 
referee Mark Goddard is a piece of garbage because there were so many times that he would get there was barely any move every five seconds if there wasn't any movement or punches he was saying gotta work guys gotta work it's like well give him a second to find to try to you know change their position a little bit and when we're on the ground and he's laying rib shots you can't tell him hey you gotta work you gotta work hey come on let's work let's fight when he's on the ground on top of the guy suffocating him and landing rib shots and this is what he was doing and then at one point he stands them up. He separates them when they're on the ground. And Usman, there was a couple of times they separated. And Usman's like, okay, I get it. Let's separate. And I'll, I'll try to get back and get the takedown. But then there was a couple of times he got up. You know, he separates them from on the ground. And Usman's like, what are you doing? I'm landing big shots on him. I'm suffocating him. He's, he's weakening. And then there's the last time Mark Goddard goes. Usman's like, what, what are you doing? And Goddard's go. You got to separate him. He's, he's like, I got to separate. It's a fight. Well, what the fuck does that mean? Even Joe Rogan has that question. What does that mean? It's a fight. Of course, yeah. And he's using an aspect of MMA to win the fight, which he did for five rounds, and he kicked his ass. It, it's just, what, what do you want him to do? You know, it's and it's the only way that Woodley was going to, you could tell, and I think this was in the fourth round, the only way that Woodley was possibly going to come back and win the fight is if he knocked him out, which means he needed to stand him up. So it's like you're going to take away one guy's advantage that he earned because you want to see more action? It's like, get out of here. You need to learn how to fucking ref. It's not about you or the fans. If the fans start booing and the guy's working, it, let him do it. So it was just a beat down. Usman, new champ, congratulations. Just dominated Woodley on every aspect. And and Woodley had no answer. He was gassed after the second round. And his corner is like, hey, you got to fucking do something now. You don't do something now, it, it's going to be over. And he, he just had no answer. He backed up. And he's always been a counter striker. He's never been one to press. And Usman took advantage of that. All right, main event, John Jones defends his title against Anthony Smith. This one was a snoozer. And this brings up my point to the, about the referees. Because there's a lot of times in this fight, and John Jones won this fight the same way he always does. He's methodical in his strikes. He came forward, kicks the legs, kicks the body. But he never really landed a lot of good head shots. A couple elbows here and there, but not a lot of good head shots. Anthony Smith from round th rounds three, four, and five was in survival mode. He did what he said he wasn't going to do, which was he let John Jones pick him apart. He didn't take any chances at all, even in the first two rounds. No chances. He had one good shot on him, one good right hand, and that was it. That cut Jones on the left eye. But he did absolutely nothing to show that he wanted to win the title. He just wanted to survive, and that was the his game plan from... It looked from the start. But the point is, is that no point in this fight, and there was there was a lot of times that they that John Jones had him pressed up against the cage and was holding his wrist, and the only shots he was doing was like a, like a shoulder, like thrusting his shoulder into his head. That was the only shots. Not one time that Herb Dean, said, Herb Dean who was now refing this fight, he also refed the Askren fight, that no point did he say, okay, guys, let's work. Okay, guys, you got to move or I'm going to separate you. He didn't do that one time. So this brings me to my point, which was my takeaway from this card. The referees need to sit down collectively and say, how are we going to officiate fights? Because you can't have one ref during one fight where he's got the guy on the ground smothering him, landing tons of rib shots, powerful rib shots. And then he's saying, let's work, let's work. He is working. And then you can't have, and then in another fight, he has him pressed up against the cage, just grabbing his wrist, holding his wrist, and then you don't say a damn thing. You can't have, there needs to be some consistency in the refing here, even if it's two different guys. So they need to have a conference, all the referees in MMA and UFC in particular, get together and find out collectively how, what system they're going to use for officiating a fight. Because this lack of consistency is going gonna, is gonna to ruin some fighter strategies. You shouldn't have a fighter having to go into a fight wondering, well, I can't do this type of style because this ref's going to separate me. You know, I can't pressure him against the cage and try to work his wrist 
because this ref says no, that he did, he's going to separate me, and but this ref can, or this ref can separate me and this ref can't. It, it's you can't have that. They need to collectively come together, and that was my biggest takeaway from the card. It was a great card, but my biggest takeaway is that the refs need to come together, have a meeting, and start officiating equally, because you can't have so many different opinions of how a fight should go. So, great card. Um, like I said, some people said on social media that it wasn't that great and the f fights fell flat. I, besides the main event where Anthony Smith was just protecting himself the whole time and John Jones could have finished him, but he chose not to because he knew that Anthony Smith wasn't going to do anything or take any chances. Other than that, the fights were great. I loved every minute of it. Very exciting. Okay, so let's move on to the AAF, AAF action from this weekend. Alliance football. Memphis Express get their first win in the season. They defeat the San Diego Fleet 26-23. Player of the game, Zach Mettenberger. He was 18 at quarterback, Zach Mettenberger, I should say. 18-25, 174 yards and one touchdown for Memphis. For San Diego Fleet, their star player, Phillip Nelson, 9 of 12, 110 yards and a touchdown. Difference in the game, four turnovers for San Diego. Otherwise, they, they outrushed them, they outpassed them, they were better on third downs, but they turned the ball over four times. It was four fumbles. Memphis capitalized, and Mike Singletary and the Memphis Express, they get the first win of the season. Orlando Apollos, best team in the league, officially, hint, hint, 20, they defeat the Salt Lake Stallions 20-11. to 11. Player of the game, Garrett Gilbert, who I believe will be on an NFL roster next year. He, right now he's playing the best quarterback play of anybody in the league. He was 22-32, 244 yards and a touchdown. For Salt Lake, their star player, Brandon Oliver, running back, 17 carries, 71 yards. Differences in the game. Total yards, Orlando had 363. Salt Lake was had a total of 265. Big factor here, third down efficiency. Orlando was 5 of 13 on third downs. Salt Lake was 1 for 9. You can't get off the field on third down. It's just going to be more punts, less scoring, and you're going to get beat, especially when you're playing Orlando because they can light it up. San Antonio Commanders hand the Birmingham Iron their first loss of the season, 12-11. to A lot of defense played this weekend, particularly because it was a lot of bad weather. In Salt Lake, it snowed. In uh, Birmingham, it was cold. It, it was just nasty weather this weekend, so there really wasn't a lot of offense. For San Antonio, key player, running back Kenneth Farrow, 30 carries, 142 yards. Birmingham, star player, running back Brandon Ross, 9 carries, 64 yards. Differences in the game, San Antonio had 161 yards rushing. Like I said, they pounded it out on them against one of the best defenses in the league. Birmingham only had 85 yards. Also, Birmingham, who I believe was like plus 7 or 8 in the turnover margin going into this game, best, best in the league, they turned the ball over four times. Not themselves this weekend, played at home, looked like garbage, and they got beat for it. They they pretty they played pretty solid defensively, but uh, like I said, 4-0 difference in the turnover. It's gonna be very hard to win. It was I mean they got close, but they scored late. It was 12 to 3. They scored late, didn't get the conversion, and San Antonio hands Birmingham their first loss. Hence the reason why Orlando, now at 4-0, is officially the best team in the league. And finally, the upset that I called, Atlanta gets their first win of the season. The Atlanta Legends, they defeat the Arizona Hotshots 14-11. Player of the game, you might remember this name, quarterback Aaron Murray. Remember him from Georgia? He was 20-33, 254 yards for Atlanta. Arizona's star player, Jarrell Pre or excuse me, Jarrell Presley, 14 carries, 110 yards. Atlanta pretty much outgained him. Was the only key stat here, 454 to 310. 
I said on Saturday that I really like Atlanta. They were an 0-3 team, but they had pieces there. They got Denard Robinson. They made a change to Aaron Murray at quarterback. It, it ended up being the best decision they made all year. They've got some great, great wide receivers. They got a lot of talent. I wouldn't be surprised if they win next week as well. Okay, so we are done recapping that. Running a little short on time here. Um, so I've decided that for the NBA and college basketball, I'm just going to run through the scores and maybe give some comments on anything that really stands out. This is Saturday scores for the NBA. We'll go over the NBA first and then college basketball for the whole weekend from Saturday and Sunday. Saturday's NBA scores. Pistons defeat the Cavs 129-93. Magic over the Pacers 117-112. Magic are looking pretty decent. I think the Magic are getting hot. 30-34 on the season. They're going to make a playoff push. You watch. The Heat over the Nets 117-88. Warriors defeat the 76ers, 120-117. Grizzlies over the Mavericks, 111-81. Spurs over the Thunder, 116-102. Pelicans defeat the Nuggets, 120-112. Suns over the Lakers, 118-109. If you're the Lakers and you're battling for the 8th spot in the Western Conference, how do you let the worst team in the NBA beat you? Embarrassing loss right there. And the Jazz who I really like, they defeat the Bucks 115-111. Jazz are looking really good. I think, uh, who was it? Donovan Mitchell, 46 points. I mean, he's a baller, and the Jazz got pieces there. They don't really have any, <clears throat> excuse me, they don't have really big stars, but they always have a solid foundation. Okay, now scores for Sunday. Trailblazers over the Hornets, 118-108. Rockets defeat the Celtics 115-104. Kyrie, this is what I feel how I feel about Kyrie. Kyrie's not the first piece of the puzzle, he's the last piece. He's no better than anybody else really as far as being a difference maker. He's a great player, but he's not a difference maker. And you know, he can close. We've seen him be able to do that, but the bottom line is he's just He's not that great. He's not gonna. He's not a game changer. He's not gonna take a team to the, to the playoffs or to the finals. He's just take them through the playoffs or to the finals. He's 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 like an average great player. He, he's not a star. He's not a superstar. He's just a star. Hawks over the Bulls, one twenty three to one eighteen. Clippers over the Knicks, one twenty eight one zero seven. Cavs defeat the Magic, one zero seven ninety three. For some reason, they decided to do back-to-back -back like baseball. I think that's kind of bullshit. Pistons over the Raptors, 112-107 in overtime. Wizards over the Timberwolves, 135-121. And the Thunder over the Grizzlies, 99-95. All right, college basketball scores from Saturday. Top 25 action. Number 15, Kansas. Or excuse me. Come on, load up, load up, you fucker. I don't care about the ads. Number one, Gonzaga over St. Mary's, 69-55. Number two, Virginia over Pittsburgh, 73-49. Duke over Miami, 87-57. Tennessee all over Kentucky, 71-52. This was a surprise. Kentucky just had no offense. And they got desperate real early, trying to hit long shots. Couldn't get it done. North Carolina over Clemson, 81-79. That was a good one. Indiana upsets Michigan State 63-62. There's a second straight upset for Indiana. They hadn't won a conference game all year. All of a sudden, they beat Wisconsin and Michigan State. UCF upsets Houston 69-64. Texas Tech over TCU 81-66. I called this upset Utah State over Nevada 81-76. Number 13 LSU over Alabama 74-69. Number 14 Purdue Blows out of Ohio State, 86-51. Number 15, Kansas over Oklahoma State, 72-67. Number 16, Kansas State over Baylor, 66-60. Number 18, Florida State. Close one over NC State, 
Uh, I'm getting there. Hold on. Bear with me. Number 19, Wisconsin defeats Penn State 61-57. Rutgers all over Iowa 86-72. I was wrong about the Hawkeyes. Uh, they do not look good. I don't know where they got the top 25 ranking, but they're starting to slip right now. Cincinnati over Memphis 71-69. And number 24, Wofford defeats Samford 85-64. Games from Sunday... Number 9, Michigan over number 17, Maryland, 69-62. Creighton upsets number 10, Marquette, 66-60. Marquette, they're going to be out of the top 25. I wouldn't doubt it. They are not playing their best basketball right now. And number 25, Washington defeats Stanford, 62-61. All right, so that wraps up the hoops. Let's move on to the ice. Sunday NHL scores. Capitals over the Rangers 3-2 in a shootout. Flyers over the Islanders 4-1. Golden Knights shut out the Canucks 3-0. Ducks defeat the Avalanche 2-1. Senators over the Panthers 3-2. Jets defeat the Blue Jackets 5-2. Predators over the Wild 3-2 in a shootout. And finally, the Sharks defeat the Blackhawks 5-2. And that wraps up all the weekend's action, and there was a lot of good games. I'm sorry I couldn't go into detail a little more, but with so much, so many good sports over the weekend, it's really hard to do that. All right, games to watch tonight. NBA action. Nuggets taking on the Spurs. I'll take the Spurs at home to defeat the Nuggets. And uh, Clippers taking on the Lakers, battle for L.A. I, I can't see the Lakers, three-and-a-half point favorite. I can't see them losing this one. I can't see them after that loss to the Suns. That's got to be a damn wake-up call. You're at home. You're playing your in-state rival. or In-state, more like in-city rival. And I just don't see them. Prime time, I don't see them losing this one. So I'll go with the Lakers in this one. NCAA men's basketball tonight. Two good ones. We got number two, Virginia, taking on Syracuse on the road. Virginia, six-point favorite. I, I, can't, I can't pull the string on Syracuse upsetting him. I just can't do it. I love how Virginia looks defensively. They've been pretty solid. I'm going to have to go over Virginia in a close one. And also, number 18, Kansas State, takes on TCU. I'm going to have to go with the upset. I was wrong about TCU upsetting Texas Tech. I, I'm not going to be wrong about this one. TCU by three. They upset Kansas State. And that wraps up Box Score Radio for today. Remember, you can follow the show on Twitter at Box Score Radio. And you can also listen for free at Podbean and on YouTube. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in.